The course kit includes a set of bearing components, useful for constructing rotating joints. Let's take a look at the parts. Here's a set. The first main component will be the shoulder screw, and they come here in two different sizes. The main feature of the shoulder screw is that it has a, a long ground surface of fairly precise dimension, uh, which can serve as a shaft and, or sometimes as just a kind of tight fit. At the end is a thread. It's a, in this case, a 1024 th thread on which nuts can be fitted to keep the parts in place or, or compress things along the shoulder screw. We provide the matching nuts. It's a 1024 nut uh, that can fit on the end of the shoulder screw. Often these are used with bushings. This is a sleeve bushing bearing. Uh, here's a pair of them, normally used in pairs. It's basically a cylinder of low friction material. It's a sintered bronze with oil embedded in it. And the idea is that it has a low friction, long lifespan surface, uh, which the steel sh uh, shoulder screw can simply slide when it's inserted. Bushings are found at a variety of scales. You'll find bushings in the supports for bridges or in like household appliances like fans and coffee grinders, sort of low cost motors. Um, you can find them in some machine tools even. Bushings are known for handling shock loading very well, very high forces. The fact that there's a lot of surface area in contact means that they are very robust to um, supporting those high forces and loads. It also means they ha they're sort of medium friction. They can have a fair amount of friction because the, a lot of surface is in contact and it is in sliding contact. But they're very low cost in a very effective way and sort of our primary means for creating uh, a, a low friction surface around which two parts can revolve. The next bearing component is a ball bearing here. You can't see this because it has shields on the side, but there's an inner race, which is the inner circle, an outer race, which is the outer hoop. And uh, between them are little tiny steel balls that are in rolling contact. As the inner race revolves, uh, the balls actually roll between the two surfaces. There's a shield that's press fit over the outside that keeps dirt out. That's why you can't see the balls. Between the balls is a little ball separator, a sort of floating metal part that keeps the balls from touching each other. Ball bearings are manufactured in incredible quantity. They're very high precision parts for the kind of prices that we pay. And they found, they're found in all kinds of machines, um, in your rollerblade wheels, in your bicycle wheels, um, all sorts of applications. Uh, ball bearings are low friction. They're good for very high speed. Um, they can also be very high precision. Uh, they come in a variety of grades uh, up to extremely high precision where the balls that are manufactured to incredible tolerances. So the parts move with very high concentricity and very, very low friction. The contact area is significantly lower than a bushing bearing, however. So the price of that low friction is also less uh, resilience in the face of impact loading. So if you have like a high impact load, the balls themselves will can deform or fracture uh, and that can lead to premature bearing failure. Cars actually use a part that we don't have here. I think they typically use roller bearings, which it's a little cylinder that's rolling instead of a ball so instead of point contact, it's a line contact, and that gives the car wheels more resilience. So ball bearings are more, a lot more costly for us than the bushing bearings, uh, but they are good for making very low friction uh, joints, especially those that have very low starting friction, low stiction, um, so that a part can move uh, slowly and stop without having a lot of sort of funny static loading right at the, at the onset of motion. Um, I'm also providing some nylon spacers these are mostly intended as kind of a thick washer, uh, but they actually can, in a pinch, be used as a light-duty uh, bushing bearing. The nylon will slide fairly easily on the, on the steel. It just wouldn't have the kind of lifespan that a, a metal bushing would have. Uh, but you would find that actually uh, useful as a way to make a kind of low-friction joint, especially if it's uh, something that's not continuously moving or not motor-driven. Um, it, could, it could serve as a reasonable kind of bearing. And then there's two different sizes of the washers. One washer is designed to fit over the ground portion of the shoulder screw, and another washer is smaller, is designed to fit just over the threads, but not over the body of the shoulder screw. So one can be used as a spacer or to help separate the parts along the assembly. The other can be used as a way to decouple the nuts from the rotating loads so that things don't rub themselves apart. So we'll cover separately sort of more theory about how to apply these things, but the first rule is just to note, bearings are always used in pairs. The nature of a single bushing on a single shaft is such that uh, there's, it's, it's only with only the sort of short length of the bushing there, there's a notable wobble of the shaft uh, moving inside the bushing. However, if they're, if they're applied in a pair with some separation between them, then the, uh, that wobble is a function of the distance between the bearings, not the width of the bearing, 
And so the wobble is greatly reduced, as well as the sort of ability to support um, can't, uh, moments uh, out of plane of the rotation. So that's sort of the first step. Now let's take a little break and go to the course site for just a moment. Um, there is, there just want to note a couple of web pages that document this. There's the course kit site, course kit page, that has the basic inventory of all the mechanical parts. On there you will find, uh, for example, links to some of the purchasing, including some uh, links, like especially the McMaster car links, that have additional technical data you might find useful. There's also a visual guide that has uh, kind of a rundown of these parts, including the parts I've just described, including some other details uh, here uh, just about these things. For example, the shoulder screws we are providing will rust if they get wet, so if you're using them in contact with the clay, you'll find they get rusty. That's not a great idea. If you follow the McMaster car links, the McMaster car pages in particular have additional sort of sizing information about the various parts, including the uh, sort of tolerancing here and uh, length and the uh, natures of the head sizing, um, which might be useful if you're trying to really fit something tightly, um, as well as with the nuts, and then some more details on the bushings. And here we see either a high load oil embedded uh, bronze sleeve bearing that are about 50 cents, 50 cents a piece or so. So that's about a tenth the price of the, of the ball bearings. So, um, so that's kind of just a, so a way to provide additional information. You should know that you can come back and find this if you need to see more, more things. Okay, let's talk briefly about the tools. The kit does not provide tools for these parts. Um, you're on your own for tools. You can get away with a lot with just hand tightening things, but just to understand what's possible. The, the, the head of the shoulder screw uh, is a, requires a hex driver that can fit into the head. This is a 1 8 inch uh, hex L driver. If you buy yourself an L driver, I highly recommend uh, getting a, a set that has uh, a ball end of the tip there. You can hardly see that here, but um, hex drivers that have a ball end uh, fit more neatly. You can sort of see there's a little roundedness there. Uh, fit at a greater variety of angles into the hex socket, and it makes it easier to, to drive it from a variety of angles. Um, these can also come as a, as a, as a kit. Here's a, here's a set that has a fold-out set that has a number of hex drivers all in one unit. That is sometimes handy. The gold standard here really is a handle driver that looks more like a screwdriver, although those sets are more expensive. Likewise, the, uh, the nut uh, takes a, a 3 8 inch wrench that can fit around the run wrench. Uh, it's a 3 8 inch, inch driver, or you can also use a, a socket driver of some kind to drive the nut. You might find it funny that in a class that uses millimeters as the design unit, we provide these inch-sized parts. But the, the raw truth is that in the United States, you can get all parts you need, but in general, the inch-sized parts are cheaper. Just when you're buying in bulk, uh, it's still more affordable to buy the inch-sized parts from our usual supplier than to buy the metric parts. So we've settled on an English standard. So these are 6.35 millimeter shoulder screws, not quarter-inch shoulder screws. But um, that's what you, that's part of the, part of the price of living in the U.S. was basically a dual unit system. Let's take a little look at that shoulder screw. Um, this is a mechanical caliper. I don't recommend you run out and buy one, but there are, these kinds of tools are very useful for uh, measuring and referencing parts. In the lab, we typically use uh, digital uh, calipers, but I thought this would be more visible in the camera view. Digital calipers are gotten, have gotten quite inexpensive, and they're usually dual unit switchable between millimeters and inches. Um, if I check the, uh, the diameter here, what we can see is that it's a couple of thousands undersized. That is actually within the spec of the part. Uh, so it's not, these come in a variety of different precisions. You can get very high precision uh, shoulder screws meant as uh, extremely tight fits on bearings. Um, these are lower cost and they have a, they're somewhat lower spec, um, but they're still suitable for kind of the light duty uh, shafts and bearings that we're using. The ball bearings are actually quite precise. In some sense, the ball bearing is more precise than this tool can easily measure. Um, and we can see it's supposed to be a 5 8 outer diameter, and we're within less than a thousandth of an inch on these calipers. Um, that's probably reasonably close. They're probably very slightly undersized. Um, often these things are spec to well under a thousandth of an inch tolerance on both the inner diameter and the outer diameter, uh, depending on the grade of bearing that you're purchasing. So they're high precision parts, uh, still fairly low cost, and they're, they're good for very low friction. So that's sort of measurement in that. And let's look at a couple now, a couple of sort of typical setups. Now, in these setups, I've just included the bearing components, and I haven't included either of the loads. But you have to think there is some structure that is on one side of the bearing and some rotating part on the other side of the bearing. There's quite a lot of variety of how you might apply these things. It could be that the inner race is the rotating part and the outer race is the fixed part, or vice versa. 
And in some cases, it's not clear which is fixed or, or moving if it's in the middle of an articulated structure. But you have to imagine that that's, there's some connection onto this shaft here, which is on, onto the two parts of the bearing, uh, which, is your, which is your actual structure um, when we sort of look at these things. So let's look first at kind of a, a typical kind of uh, uh, bushing setup here. And the idea is what I've set up here is I say there's a shaft, and then uh, we're going to have um, a bushing at one uh, sort of near one end uh, and a bushing near the other end. And then there's some kind of retention system. Often it's handy to use the nuts in pairs, then they can, they can tighten against each other, and that helps keep them from coming out. Here I just have one, and then a washer. So in this case, you might imagine that one bushing is press fit into some material, which is rigid, and then the other bushing is press fit into some other material, which is rigid, so there's a clevis formed. And then the center of the shaft is where some other part is attached that would pivot. And then um, in this case, the sh the uh, the outer housing, the outer face of the bushing would be fixed and the inner face would be the uh, sliding against the shaft and the shaft would be rotating. Um, if you have a different load structure, you might easily imagine that the two bushings are closer together, in which case you'd have material at one bushing and material at the other bushing that's, that's fixed. And then you'd have a cantilevered shaft where a load would be attached somewhere out further on the, on the bearing and the load would be outside the structure that's supporting it um, and cantilevered it on the outside. And that's also uh, an acceptable way to make, build a shaft. The key is that in all cases, there's some pair of bearings on the shaft and they have some separation between them because it's the separation between them that determines uh, how much play there is and how well the, the, the torques of the, the weight of the object or the off-center loads are turned into radial forces at the bearings. Actually, let's go back for one second and talk about those terms as well. Uh, bearings are usually described as having uh, two directions of load. There's the radial load, which is the, the load that would be perpendicular to the shaft. So if you have something like, like a bearing structure like this, where there's a weight on the bearing, that weight translates to a force that is a face-to-face -face contact that's straight into the shaft. That's the radial load. The axial load would be the, the load along the axis of the shaft. And ball bearings are designed primarily for radial load. So the forces in this case would be from the outer housing uh, in through the balls to the shaft. If you apply some, some loading between the, from the side, basically, in this, in this orientation along the axis of the shaft, that's thrust loading. It's called thrust loading. And ball bearings can handle a limited amount of thrust loading without trouble, um, but they're not really designed for extreme thrust loading. There are other special bearings that are designed to either support a combination of radial and thrust loads or to support um, pure thrust loads and all sorts of cases in between. So there's these ball bearings are okay for a moderate thrust load, but not excessive. Um, so the idea is with the bearing pair separated is you're trying to convert uh, torques around the end of the shaft into a set of a pair of radial loads on the bearings. And we'll see that in more detail when we do drawings. Here's another, here's another setup where I've used a pair of ball bearings and I've just thrown in some other washers to sort of say, oftentimes you have this problem where you have uh, a fixed length shoulder screw uh, and then some other structural detail determines exactly where the bearings are placed, and you end up with extra length either on the inside or outside that you end up having to take up. Um, sometimes I see students using the actual bushings as, as washers, effectively, or spacers along the shaft, and it's a perfectly fine use for them, although you run out of uh, bushings in a hurry that way. Here, the nylon washers might serve, for example, to take up some extra length along the shaft to place the ball bearings um, at sort of the right uh, distance between them. And then again, once again, it sort of depends on your design, whether it's the shaft that you consider to be fixed and the ball bearings, uh, in this case, providing rotation around the shaft, or if you consider the bearings to be fixed and then the shaft rotating inside. And the bearing is neutral to whichever use you use. It's just relative motion. Um, but your design could use either style, depending on, on how the whole system is structured. And then here I have a kind of setup where I've just shown that it is possible to use the nylon washers as bushings. Um, it's very similar to the previous bushing case, only the holes will be a different size. But um, it would provide a moderate sort of uh, quality of, of low friction bearing um, where the shaft would be able to rotate inside the washers. And they would be, you know, they're nylon, so the uh, nylon and steel has got reasonably low friction. And the lifespan won't be as long as the metal bushings, but um, it would be adequate for the kind of machines that we're building. So there you go. There's a kind of set of parts, uh, some nomenclature on the actual parts. Um, quick rundown on tools and dimensions and hopefully a little visual guide to help prompt you into how you might uh, use these to build larger structures.